News Nation family, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also help support this channel by getting yourself some Skiba News Nation merch. Also, we are proud to announce that we are now on Patreon, where you will get bonus content, shoutouts, and much more. Thank you again for watching and helping us stay on the quest for truth. Huge shout out to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this show without you. If you want to help support us, go to patreon.com forward slash Skiba News Nation. We are also proud to announce that Skiba News Nation podcast is now available on podcast platforms. Welcome to Skiba News Nation, bringing you unfiltered views, news, interviews, discussions, and more. And now, here's your host, Jeremiah Skiba award-winning musician and son of Rob Skiba. Hey Skiba News Nation family, I'm your host Jeremiah Skiba and welcome to another episode, episode 15 of Skiba News Nation. Today we're going to be talking about the Baphomet trans and chemical castration. The queen has died exactly 911 days since Crown V was announced as a pandemic. My friend Alex Stein connects the dots with conspiracies on Tucker Carlson. Supply line threatened by freight train strikes and stock market. An all new Opus Corner. And I saw George Bush on 9 11, Sam Cooke and his strange murder, memes, and much more. So stay tuned. So let's dive right in. So before we do that, let me introduce my co host, Jake Grant. Welcome, Jake. How you doing? Hey, what's up, Jeremiah? What have you been How up to? How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, my wife and I were. Uh... We're getting ready to pack up and head towards Missouri area. Uh, we got some friends out there. So in the next couple of weeks, we're kind of getting ready for a little bit of a move. We're going to be out there for a few months during the biblical feast season. And it's going to be pretty great. But we're going to keep plugging away with Skiba News Nation. So don't worry, nothing's changing there. Yeah, that's kind of what we've been thinking about and been up to lately. That's cool, man. You, you travel a lot. I, I wish I could do that. Like, just have be always on the move i think that's a cool way to cool way to live i mean you only live once right we love it man we love that lifestyle uh we have an rv that we like to travel in and i've noticed more and more of the truther community the to community uh the fe community a lot of people who are in these kind of fringe groups that have a love for the truth uh, there's a consistent pattern i'm starting to recognize that people are getting mobile house situations rvs trailers uh they're you know getting used to tent can't you know going and camping out and getting out there and and really one of the only ways to get around communities of like-minded people is to be mm -hmm. willing to travel very similar to like the Bertaria times festival uh put on by owen benjamin's group uh and and the bear community and groups like that groups like feast keeping to people uh, they all seem to be like, hey, hey, wait a second. If the stuff hits the fan, right, I want to yeah. be able to pack my family up with relative shelter over my head and be able to go wherever it's going to be safe because you never know what areas you know you want to get out of. And especially those who are still in the cities, uh, I think for them, they're like, hey, at any moment's notice, we need to probably – we might need to get out of Dodge, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. Uh, but consistently I'm seeing in all these communities – People love getting RVs and, and they're traveling and there's even a, the, the community we're going out to be a part of in Missouri for a, a, a couple months is uh, kind of taking over an entire uh, RV park. Really? And so like imagine cool. going to a place where you're not the only tin, tinfoil hat person, right? But you're <laughs> one of like 50 families who are all eating, you know, barbecues together, sitting around the campfire each night. Sounds like you a good know, community. It's a good, oh, uh, you like build your own family there, you know? I, I've been looking oh, at, yeah. I, I always watch like RV YouTube videos and my girlfriend sometimes makes fun of me for it. But uh, <laughs> have you ever heard of the Tacozilla? 
It's a Tacoma that no, they I made have... into a camper. It's like the coolest thing ever because I, I drive a Tacoma. So I just en envision like how would they even make it livable? But it's really cool. It's like bigger than you think. It's not even a Tundra. It's the Tacoma. It's the, the smaller one. But oh, we'll oh, have yeah, to put a clip. Pretty cool. I'll put a clip in here of it because it's super cool looking. It looks like vintage and retro and pretty cool. But yeah, check well, that out, Well, if you out, ever man. get an RV and or a camper or something and want to hit the road let us know and we'll go on a trip together we'll, we'll hit up some some festivals we, or something we could do uh skiba news nation on the road you know oh yeah like kind of like cool. uh you know popular podcasters out there they just put their studio in the back and drive to their guests yeah like steve-o i think steve-o yeah. does that now <laughs> all right man well you want to dive right into some current history yeah 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 we got some great news for everybody let's do it all right <laughs> All right, so this week we're going to be covering, of course, some controversial news. Uh, we have the passing of a monarch. We have the passing of George W. Bush's favorite hall. Oh, man, I just almost stole your line. Yeah, um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> it was too good, man. Okay, I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let Jeremiah say it when we cover that segment later on, everybody. But uh, we're going to be covering uh, the 9-11 topic. Uh, as the PSYOP continues 21 years later, um, we're going to be covering uh, a little bit about the collapse of society and the economy. Uh, there's a current strike happening uh, with freight train workers. Uh, we're going to be covering just the topic of conspiracies in general. And then we're going to be looking about some of the, at some of the technology that could have made uh, the Building 7 collapse in free fall standing. Uh, as well as the two towers that were hit by planes, how it could have happened. Um, now, there's definitely something to uh, this narrative that's very interesting, the 9-11 narrative. We just passed through the 21st anniversary of that time, and people still buy the official narrative. Yep. But we, you know, there's already the slogan about kind of tacking on a, a secondary meme here. Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, right? <laughs> well... Did you know the World Trade Center Building 7 didn't kill itself? Yep. You know what I'm saying? I know. So uh, we're going to be talking about how that was possible with Nikola Tesla style technology. We're going to show a little bit of a video with that. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of uh, Fauci and a little about about the ouchie, uh, of course, and um, we're going to kind of get into some interesting stuff. So if we can, we're going to start off with uh, a, a topic of um, identifying the people that are committing evil in this world, uh, sometimes we can fall into the trap of saying those people or they, the big vague they of conspiratorial association, right? Well, one of the best ways to combat evil in the world is to identify the people who are perpetrating it and the people who are funding it and the people who are providing whether it's the the drugs or the the money to make the evil happen um and so one of the narratives that we have been addressing and we should address is the transgender agenda that has come onto the western world uh and i just want to remind everyone the baphomet was transgender before it was cool <laughs> <laughs> you know so yeah. there's a direct tie with kind of the the inverse nature of satanism and kind of the brainwashing and the confusion that is being put on the western populace to mix the two genders uh and you can see coming out of the baphomet's pants here uh interesting enough is a phallus symbol with the two snakes wrapped around it and we know that this symbol is very akin to the medical systems symbol, uh, mm -hmm. I forget uh, the exact terminology. Let me just Google it real quick. It's called uh, SICK, the SICK medical system. <laughs> the rod of Asclepius is the one with a single snake, but the rod of Asclepius with the single snake and what we see coming out of Baphomet's pants uh, is, is interesting how close in similarity they are. 
Um, yep. But the re revelation here is that I hate to use the crude terminology here. And of course, this isn't a show for children. So if your kids are listening, plug their ears. But the recent system that screwed the Western world and the entire world through their pharmacia and their mandates was the medical system. And so if we had to make the metaphor here before we jump into this alarming video that is tied to the Baphomet, transgenderism, and the medical system, uh, and the castration of children chemically, uh, pretty much this is how the Baphomet, or, or Satan, you know, another name for the, the Baphomet, who satanic cults worship, yeah. um, whether knowingly or unknowingly, is he's screwing people over with the medical system. And, and you can see that that's his penis in this picture. Uh, sorry to be so explicit. Uh, <laughs> came out kind of uh, a, a little disjuntled I mean, there. But at, at least it's the medical much. term. That's the medical term for it. So it's not a bad word, right? <laughs> that's how we get around it. Oh, man. You two won't flag us. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Opa, well, let's go ahead and play that first video about chemical uh, castration and some of the, you know, expose of doctors who are pushing this. And let's ask the question, who is providing these chemicals for castrating those who are underage, who have been brainwashed or convinced that they're a different gender? Uh, well, it's it's medical companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies that are, are creating these chemicals. And then specific doctors like this one you're going to see in this video who are hiding the fact that they're doing this atrocity by just changing their terminology. So let's watch this video. Right, which mm -hmm. has actually been used to chemically castrate sex offenders. You know what? I'm not sure that we should continue with this interview because it's. She cannot even talk about the medication she's giving children, which is, which is the same to castrate criminals because it's. You know what? It's kind of problematic. You're giving this medication to kids. Well, you're a medical professional. I am a medical professional. So you don't want to talk about the drugs that you give to kids or. Again. I'm a physician and I use medication. You're choosing exploitive words. Drugs. Exploitive words. Drugs I give to I'm Drugs. That's what the f it is, wow. demon. Okay, drugs that's I give to I'm, I'm choosing. As you can see, what a great reaction video there. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctors who are administrating these chemicals to castrate children chemically. They don't even want to answer. The trans they won't even say the word of drug or or even talk about how that same drug is used for prisoner castration. <laughs> like, oh man. And another one of the, uh, the topics of course, that is tied to this is discovering where do the, the hormone blockers that pharmaceutical companies are producing to push this agenda further, where are those medicines coming from? And, uh, if you do a little bit of research, you'll find the perpetrators of this evil in the world. Of course, any pharmaceutical company that is creating these transgender drugs pretty much mm -hmm. to facilitate this agenda, they're the, the boogies, right? And so we can stop using the all encompassing vague word of they, the they, the bad guys, and we can start pointing our finger and saying, you guys are perpetrating an evil on mankind uh, that is unprecedented. And you guys are the ones who need to stop and, and we can stop just vaguely referring to the powers that be, you know, and, and, and how do we stop things? We get very explicit with who's involved, uh, yeah. starting with doctors like this blue haired woman. And, um, uh, you know, that th was kind of one of the, the topics I want to cover here. And of course, um, in recent news, we have the topic of the queen's health. Uh, mm. And so I just wanted to remind everyone, right, uh, please be respectful when talking about the queen and her health or the state of her health. As she is the head of a state, a monarch, a mother to multiple pedophiles and a devout cousin to her husband. Um, but uh, the state of her health is that she just recently passed away, of course. And I, I heard that she's uh, still alive, that that she, you know, faked her death and is living out the rest of her days in the Bahamas with Tupac. Back with Tupac and yeah, uh, Elvis. Yeah, and Elvis, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, for my ma- my bad joke. <laughs> I had to throw it in there. Of course, a beloved figure of the British people and of the British Empire at large, a a monarch for I think near seventy plus years. Um, so very, very established, you know, very heartbreaking for the British people. Um, this is Biden's input on the queen's passing. He says, dear queen, <laughs> sorry about your death. I really liked Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend sent me that and I could not stop laughing when I saw that, that meme. <laughs> um, That's so, awesome. you know, of course, you know, we're not trying to be disrespectful of the dead or anything. Uh, there is an interesting conspiratorial tie with this topic of the Queen. Oh, yeah? um, did you know that f- from and including Wednesday, March 11th, 2020, which was the announcement of the, you know, the the crown V, uh, you know, which is what Corona stands for, crown, right, uh, yep. is 911 days to the date of the Queen's passing. So... There's an interesting numerical conspiracy there for you guys. Uh, the queen died 911 days after the announcement of the crown virus. You know, so um, 9/11. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about 9/11 since just a few days ago is the passing of that anniversary once again. Um, in some other news, uh, the Taliban has banned crypto in Afghanistan and arrest dealers of tokens. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of interesting and, and funny, you know, thinking of how, uh, you know, very rural uh, Afghanistan seems to be, pro- you know, uh, projected as in mm-hmm. how tr- 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 turbulent it is there. Um, it's funny how uh, the Taliban's banned the crypto market industry. Recently this year, there's been a lot of uh, bankruptcy in the cryptocurrency uh, markets, one of which personally affected me too. Uh, a lot of crashes in the cryptocurrency economy. Now, of course, when we talk crypto, we are talking the precursor to a one world currency. We're talking about the beginnings of, uh, of corporate backed currencies uh, and, um, sorry, uh, government crypto coins. So uh, when we talk of like the mark of the beast and how somebody wouldn't be able to buy or sell in the biblical sense of the word. Uh, this is the technology that would allow that to be possible. Uh, and it's interesting how, um, you know, in the nomenclature, the name it's the block and the chain. Uh, so what, what does a guy do in those old fashioned prisons whenever he gets chained up for the, you know, breaking rocks team, right? They're, they're Mm -hmm. on a ball and a chain, a block and a chain. Um, and they can't get away. Uh, so just something to be aware of as this market goes up and down, there's definitely fortune to be made and there's also fortunes to be lost. So we're going to go on to our next video here, Opa. It's, uh, a comment on the, the eco agenda by, uh, Jordan Peterson threatening Taiwan at the moment. What are we going to do without chips? I don't know what these people are thinking. What are the, uh, environmentalists thinking we love the planet it's like do you we love the poor do you okay let's pit the planet against the poor who wins the planet okay you don't love the poor that much do you love the planet or do you hate capitalism let's pit those two things against each other oh well it turns out we actually hate capitalism how can we tell because you're willing to break it And you know what's going to happen. So what's going to happen in Sri Lanka with these 20 million people who now have nothing to eat? Are they going to eat all the animals? Are they going to burn all the firewood? They're stockpiling firewood in Germany. It's like, so is your environmental globalist utopia going to kill the poor and destroy the planet? And that's okay, because we'll wipe out capitalism. So uh, an interesting breakdown there of Jordan Peterson. Of course, he's definitely not uh, pro-FE with all that indoctrination. He slipped into some of his fairly intelligent breakdown of the uh, kind of the the leftist agenda of Mm -hmm. preserving the environment while destroying capitalism. Uh, So I just wanted to share that clip because we have a lot of a, a... economy based policies that are being pushed through with the Biden administration 
Um, mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion on Jordan Peterson? Have you seen much of his stuff there? I mean, I, I, I thought he was always a good guy. You know, he was always a conservative, right? I mean, that's what I was always under the impression. Oh yeah. Of. Very, very conservative. Sorry, and he's, a Can he's a Canadian too. So he sounds like uh, Kermit the Frog if he was Canadian, you know, talking like this and like a boot and you know, <laughs> this is how we do stuff. And so that always captured my attention and I always seemed to like that. So, <laughs> but it reminds me of our, uh, our friend, Robbie Davidson, he, you oh, know, okay. inserting in there, the globe, this, and uh, are you too worried about the destruction oh, okay. of the globe here? And then I they understand. would show the picture of a globe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, you know, he just doesn't know. people can't work around the indoctrination. Absolutely. So anyways, that was an interesting clip. Uh, I have an interesting conspiracy short for you guys. It's our next oh, yeah? video of Mark Zuckerberg. Let's check this Little out. Zuck Zuckerberg. In interviews, he always seems off. Yeah, yeah. So there's this one interview and they asked him to take off his hoodie. Yeah. And he was like, uh, no, I, I can't. And he's sweating, <laughs> bro. That's suspect. This guy was dripping sweat. Okay, you want to take off the hoodie? There you go. No, I never take off the hoodie. I know you don't. What's with that? There's a group of women in the audience that wish you would. So they take off the hoodie. Look, look, he's like sweating his sweat. Whoa. Why is that serious? He's stressing. He's stressing. Why is, he's stressing. He's stressing. Why is it that serious, right? Take off, I know, they take off a hoodie. Now, check this out. She ends up making him take it off. Uh -huh. And this is what happens. This is a great moment. So he takes it off. History. This guy's sweating bricks. <laughs> Look at it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah. No, it's a thick hoodie. We. It's um. It's a company hoodie. We print our mission on the inside. What? Oh, oh my really? God, the inside of the hoodie, everybody. Look at his face. Look at his reaction. He's trying to pull it back. Making the. Oh. Making the world look! 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 Listen. Oh my God! It's like a secret Ooh. cult. <laughs> Yo, look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> Making the world open and connected. Stream. Did you see that? What did you oh think about gosh. that, man? He is so weird. Zuckerberg is so weird. <laughs> And, and uh, we'll, I'll be talking about this later on, but when me and my girlfriend were at this baseball game, Texas Ranger baseball game, they had a whole uh, thing uh, dedicated to Sweet Baby Ray's. And I don't know if you know about Zuckerberg and Sweet Baby Ray's. Have you ever seen a compilation video where he's like, Sweet Baby no, Ray's? Like he's, like, he's like obsessed with it. <laughs> and <laughs> we were just laughing the whole time because he, it's like he drinks Sweet Baby Ray's. So everything he does is kind of, you know, a little odd. I think. I, mean, I thought it was really interesting the logo on the back of his hoodie that he seemed mm -hmm. to be very nervous about letting people see, right? And he talks about how they printed their company's slogan or, or whatever on inside. Why would it be on the inside of the hoodie, first and of all? Why would you maybe even wear it? Say, why would you even wear it to the yeah, event? Yeah, maybe it's the hoodie that you're supposed to be able to flip inside out. But yeah. it was interesting that the slogan was making the world more interconnected through communication, you know, or whatever. And uh, just see, he seemed very awkward. It reminded me of how George W. Bush and Clinton w. would act whenever they were questioned about the Skull and Bone Society. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, yeah, I do know what you're saying. And you guys will see it in history. I got some Skull and Bones in there for you today, too. Oh, okay, okay. Little, little, know, like, we're gonna... Easter eggs. One of Rob's favorite topics to point out why he's a conspiracy theorist started back with 9-11. Now, we're going to show one of his mm -hmm. short clips breaking down uh, the conspiracy in general. Um, let's go ahead and show uh, Fauci video number one. Fauci, ouchie. It's crazy they took that song out of our last video, by the way, <laughs> Jeremiah. I know, and it was sped up in everything. Well, no, if she got the flu for 14 days, she's as protected as anybody can be because the best to get infected yourself. And that'd be the same with COVID, right? Same applies to the virus. Is she had COVID, she doesn't need to get the COVID. She, she could get one, you know, she can do one as some extra protection. So just one and done. One and done is probably all she needs because then the sort of, if she's already at the doctor's office, she might as well get a second Natural immunity. Two sh she's good to go. And that would really be That's all it. she would need, except for the boosters, of course, because those offer this sort of extra uh, immunity. Then she's protected. And then, of course, just to be sort of <laughs> extra safe, I would just get a booster shot every six months for the rest of your life, and that'll sort of just get that ultra protection. <laughs> uh, I love... Oh, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's true. Doctors of money. 
They're all yeah, kickbacks. The love of money is the root of all evil, guys. And we know the past two years, Big Pharma has pushed and pushed lobbyists and uh, and government interests to create these mandates to create some of the fear around this topic. Um, it's 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 pretty. It, it's a big deal, and this is a great kind of uh, breakdown of of guys like Fauci and how his opinion has changed uh, regarding protection for infection. And it's just the hundred dollar bill sliding right in front of his eyeballs. <laughs> it's tucking it in his jacket. <laughs> oh man. Uh, okay, that leads us into our next, a uh, little bit more of a serious topic, uh, our Facebook link, uh, OPA. The same people who are concerned about your health want you to stop having babies and allow toxic chemicals in your food. Something's not adding up. Let's watch this next video. So yes, there's a lot of things chemically happening right now. A lot of people are blaming plastics for it, as plastics have been found in people's bloodstreams. Uh, there's there's a chemical warfare happening right now that is affecting not just the human body, but the human mind. And I think this is why a lot of people have been going crazy. This is why I think there's more homelessness. Uh, it, there's a bigger homelessness problem out there than there was before, which is usually linked to a mental health crisis. I think right now we are going through some kind of medical intervention that that is not natural, that is destroying human life on this planet. But, but, but Luke, a great man once said, there are too many people on this planet. <laughs> oh my gosh. And uh, that was Bill Gates, by the way. And um, uh, don't you think he's right? There are too many people, Luke? Absolutely not. I think uh, what Elon Musk uh, has been talking about, the opposite problem occurring, especially in a few decades from now, is the real problem because yeah. it's actually backed by science. It's actually backed by data that is not paid and bought for by Bill Gates. And it's highlighting a huge crisis of civilization that's going to be hitting our way, especially in the Western world where people aren't making children. One, because people can't, sometimes because people don't want to because they've been brainwashed and propagandized not to. To me, in my personal opinion, we are going through a population reduction program. A lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people are not aware of it. A lot of people are just living their lives, trusting the authorities, and they're being chemically attacked and castrated in a way that's going to stop them from reproducing. But you yeah. you think it's on purpose? Absolutely. I, don't I, think think, I think there's two motives here. One is profit and incentive, and I think the other one is deliberate and I think both are playing a part here I think there's a few people that are saying too many people in this world we have to intervene we have to incentivize the use of GMOs we have to incentivize the use of glassophyte we have well, to well, incentivize well, the use of high fructose corn quick. syrup yeah real quick there are people like Bill Gates who have publicly stated there are too many people and we have to take action mm -hmm. absolutely now beyond that you know, there's there's corporations that are incentivized to do this because then big industries like corn, high fructose corn syrup, and glyphosate are subsidized and of course given to these corporations for very cheap. They of course give it out to the general public and whether it's seed oils, high sugar, or or just the the chemicals that are banned in so many other countries, we give it to our children. The diet that our children are given is absolutely horrendous. It's leaving to brain defects and it's leaving towards a destroyed civilization that of course won't be able to get up from its feet because it's being bombarded with yeah. poisons. Yeah. I will so, add this though, but like, cause I agree 100% with what you're saying that it is deriv derivative of, you know, of, a, of, a, of something chemical, but I would also add that it's something derivative of propaganda, which is another word that you use. Um, we were talking before the show, you use the word choice. You know what I'm saying? And people think like that people choosing to eat bad food. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, yeah, it is something to do with choice, but that choice is part and parcel of propaganda. People are kind of reacting to a certain pattern of stimuli that's propagandized to them by certain movements and certain things that happen in a very pervasive and inundative way. Yes. You know, second wave feminism had a very uh, negative effect on how we move as a society. You know what I mean? Going into the uh, the you know 21st century but there's two other layers here that I think are important to understand beyond just propaganda one is that the food is engineered to be chemically addictive mm -hmm. so when you have it it literally is engineered to hit the pleasure centers in your mind so you become addicted to the sugar to the seed oils another aspect to really understand here is that it's also cheap and readily available because mm -hmm. it's subsidized okay. by big industries that have bought off politicians that are going along with this agenda and don't even know that they're doing it. Yeah, so we as people are being led in the way that yeah. we that they think we should go. Some of those quotes at the end there are very significant, especially in relation to the past uh, two years and that particular medical experiment and the cheap, readily available, you know what, that uh, 
of course, we had that little skit we played right before. Um, but there's a concerted effort, not just through the transgender agenda, but also mm -hmm. through the products that we consume, the food, the, the plastics that work their way into our foods and drinks, the chemicals that are found uh, in our medicines and the things that we put into our body through a syringe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are kind of furthering this agenda of world depopulation. Uh, and then we have, of course, the the rare outliers of guys like Elon Musk, who's like, well, I need to, you know, definitely have twelve children because, uh, you know, we're we're heading towards drastic, <laughs> you know, world uh, population issues. So there are some people that are pushing the the correct narrative. Of course, the 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 bear community, the truther community, the Torah community, all these people are also uh, very big proponents of having a big family. Do you know the first commandment in the Bible was be fruitful and multiply? Mm -hmm. Well, no wonder the first thing that they are attacking in the human health system is our reproductive ability, right? Yeah. They want us to stay sterile. They want us to not have families. Um, and, uh, and, and partially, you know, there's an interesting conspiracy tied to the uh, social security uh, element going bankrupt. Uh, and so they're trying to get the population numbers down because they won't be able to pay social security uh, benefits out to those who retire to the extent that they've promised. And it's just an unsustainable, uh, you know, and that's just one of the reasons that they're trying to depopulate people. They're trying to, you know, X off the older generation before they can cash in on those benefits. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of rambling off the top of my head, but let's go ahead and play this next video from it's uh the instagram video i shared from uh, bard king 777 uh you know it, it's a it's a great interesting convo between uh with tucker carlson mm -hmm. and um it's how people who fear the virus it's pushing through a freedom of speech uh censorship agenda um so anyways let's go ahead and play this video on instagram that's Alex Stein, by the way, the guy that I was talking and about. And then, you know, we have to get conspiratorial and we look at the Iran Contra. The CIA was trading drugs with Nicaraguans for guns. We were giving them guns and then they were taking that cocaine and they were flying it into Mena, Arkansas, which Bill Clinton happened to be the governor of that state. And they were taking those drugs and they were putting them in Florida. They were putting in California, Freeway, Ricky Ross. So they created the crack epidemic. So the people, the same people that did that, they're creating the problems that we have today. So it's just a new drug for a new era. Amazing. <laughs> Not really. So, it's scary. No, no, no. I know what you I mean. mean. I know you mean that sarcastically. Yeah, right? no, but it's what's just interesting because, I mean, I grew up in a world where, and I, speaking for myself, I actually believe that conspiracy theories were the way that dumb, uninformed people explained a complex world. Yeah. You couldn't understand what was actually happening. You resorted to a conspiracy theory, and that was a mark of a low IQ. Of course. Now, I always think this. The more informed, the smarter the person, the more likely they are to be connecting the dots that you're connecting. So you grew up in a world where people just like assumed that the system was not on the level, I think. Well, it's called cognitive dissonance. It's like, you know, the government is, you know, has done corrupt stuff. You know, there's classified levels of intelligence that you'll never be a part of, but you have cognitive dissonance thinking that the government has your back. They don't. It's a personal people control system. They want to control us. And that's one of the biggest parts of why they want to keep you depressed. Because Tucker, when you're constantly depressed, you're in what is called fight or flight. So you, your hormone response is constant cortisol. And that's why Brian Stelter, those guys, they constantly have the ticker on CNN, how many people die, how many people die. Because people get addicted to that hormonal response. And once you're in that fear state of fight or flight, you can't see the forest for the tree right in front of your face. Yes. So then they can literally, like a dog with a treat, they can make you do whatever you want. And that treat is just more trauma, what I call trauma-based mind control, just more fear tactics in order to control you. So that's what's happening now is the mainstream media, not you, but the, most of the mainstream media uses fear to control us. And that's the same mechanism that the government uses. I couldn't agree more. All righty. It's crazy. So, that, that's, that's my friend. That's my friend, Alex Stein. Uh, he'll be on- Oh, really? He said he would be on the show. He's the one that does the uh, the the word I can't say. Uh, the, the what was the name of the song that that you played on the show that were, that was kicked off that we were just talking about? Oh, Fauci Fauci. Yes, he came up with that, and he goes to town hall meetings, and he's like, you know, he makes up these raps and calls him out on all this stuff that they're doing, and he uh, the wow. way that he does it is so hilarious. 
So if you, uh, if you if you ever want a good laugh, type in Alex Stein ninety nine or or uh, just Alex Stein goes to the you know city council and it's so funny. He just calls them out for their hypocrisy, but sometimes in a rap song, sometimes in a dress, or sometimes as a woman di like a woman diver, you know, like he's just calling out whatever is the craziest thing, and uh, we still oh, text. Man, that sounds great. He would I definitely mean, he has the some show. really based things he's saying there, so that'd mm -hmm. be great if we could get him on the show. That'd be very cool. Yeah, I'll have um, to ask him for sure. But yeah, I mean, just kind of sum up. Uh, we're sharing all. I'm sharing all these news topics and these videos because, just like he said, it's the fear-based trauma mind control element that's allowing all these agendas agendas to be pushed through to the society at large. And we've had some of the most fear punished you know dished out in the past two years that has totally changed the world and it will never be the same again and so how do we overcome the fear-based trauma mind control well we turn off the tvs we build our own communities we focus on our families we focus on the good the true the beautiful we focus on gardening we focus on our our gifts and talents and abilities and developing those and we we don't turn a blind eye you know we need to still to have watchmen on the wall right but mm -hmm. we don't allow their disruptive narratives to change our lives. Instead, whenever their society collapses, we will have better, stronger alternatives ready in our own communities. And that's how we stay focused on the positive, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so so in, in relation to, you know, the possible collapse of the current supply chain and why you need to have local businesses and friends that you can trade and commute you know uh, trade with and uh derive you know uh bartering and 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 have a good supply lane supply chain locally uh we have this story of a uh, freight train worker strike could cause a massive supply chain crisis as well as halt commuter trains um and it says 30 percent of all items transported in the u.s is shipped by train so we're going to show this next video on CBS News Chicago, OPA. Now at 4.30, we are closer to a strike by workers on American freight trains. As the two sides remain at odds on matters related to health care and paid time to see a doctor, the trickle-down effects here could be massive. CBS 2's Chris Ty live for us with the latest. And come Friday morning, Chris, commuters might need to find another way to get into the city. But I know it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there, Jim and Marie. Three big storylines to keep an eye on as this possible railroad strike looms. Number one, Amtrak. They have already canceled six lines either into or out of Chicago because if those trains took off, they would be in transit Friday morning when the strike happens, stranding those travelers. Number two, Metra is warning those in the Chicagoland area, hey, if this strike happens, the majority of our train lines will not run on Friday because they run on Union track. And number three, supply chain. We learned so much about it during the pandemic, and there is a concern that everything from next week's dinner to possibly the presents under your tree this Christmas could be impacted. This is the airspace over the ultra-busy Union Pacific Trail uh, rail yard in Melrose Park. Illinois will feel the effects of this acutely. We have the second most lines of track in the U.S. in Illinois, only behind Texas. A quarter of all goods shipped in the U.S., one out of four, come through Chicago. If there is a strike, more trains in this country would stop moving. Those that ship grain and fruits and vegetables, coal, even chlorine to keep our drinking water clean. We have not had a strike like this since the early 90s. Now, insiders do not expect the strike to happen Friday, but if it happens, it will be the job of Congress to mediate through it. And there isn't much hope inside the industry, given the current political climate. A day or two, as we said, uh, it, it's not something that uh, we're going to feel that much. But if we start talking about uh, a week, uh, two weeks or three weeks, uh, it's going to be really serious. What consumers uh, may be faced with is empty store shelves and rising prices for the goods that remain on the shelves. We are in what is now being called a cooling off period between the two sides at the bargaining table again. That is slated to end on Friday. The insiders we spoke with put the odds of this strike happening at about 20%. Senator Durbin weighed in on this. He talks about why he doesn't think Congress should step in. You'll hear from him. 
tonight on our news at 6. For now, live in the South Loop, Chris Tide, CBS 2 News. We'll see you then, Chris. Thank All you. Right, good. All right. Wow. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, the supply chain looks like there's possible shortages incoming with the freight being backed up through the strike. I mean, uh, it's pretty frightening. I mean, we already had so many shortages, so... It's in all relation to this next short article I want to share before we move on to our history segment and Opus Corner is, um, you know, the ASX slumps and Wall Street has suffered the biggest fall since 2020 after U.S. inflation shock. Uh, and this came out 19 hours ago. Uh, but around $60 billion has been wiped off the value of the Australian shares after U.S. Inflation, inflation rose faster than expected in August, prompting fears of more aggressive interest rates rising rise, rises by the U.S. Central Bank. Um, so just uh, the, you know, points, the Dow Jones index fell 3.9 points to 31,000. Consumer prices in North America increased by 0.1 points. Uh, and all ordinary indexes fell. Uh, so, you know, the big, you know, the big headline here, the biggest drop since, uh, 2020. And, wow. you know, it, it's just something to be aware of that there's definitely, uh, an alarming effect on our economy following the, the shutdowns of the past two years, following not to mention the world economics, great reset uh agenda and their you know desire to reset the financial system of the world uh of course cryptocurrency will play a, a role and probably the comeback whatever is used to replace this collapsing system of the petrodollar mm. so uh we don't know how far reaching this is what the time of implications are but it's definitely something to be aware of is that there is big inflation concerns in the u.s that uh you know the stock market's been crashing um, so well, thank God for the in Inflation Reduction Act. They did so much good oh, yeah, there. I know, right? <laughs> thank, thank God for the eighty-seven thousand IRS agents that are going to come and you know grab you by the neck till you pay and your get taxes. their money. Yeah, and get their money because we're we're dealing with inflation. We need that. <laughs> we need that extra penny. So, so all right. So that's all the news I had to talk to. You guys about today, uh, you know, of course, covering the, the queen passing away, covering some of the agendas that are being pushed through. Um, and of course, the coming, you know, economic collapse of the Western world. No biggie. Uh, just, you know, stay positive. Focus on your local community. Uh, probably get your money out of the banks at some point. That's yeah. that's probably uh, <laughs> what I would do <laughs> if I had any money in the bank, you know. But other than that, uh, thanks, guys, for listening to the news. Thanks, Jake. I mean, I always get my current news from you. Like, you, you always show me something that I haven't seen before. So, thank you for the great current news. And, uh, Opa, is it time for an Opa's Corner? My hood, der hat drei Ecken. Drei Ecken hat mein Hut. Und hat er nicht drei Ecken, dann ist es nicht mein Hut. Welcome to another episode of Opa's Corner. So, we start off with a story. A husband and wife who work for the circus go to an adoption agency looking to adopt a child. But the social worker there raised doubts about their suitability. So, the couple produced photos of their 50-foot motorhome which is clean and well-maintained and equipped with a beautiful nursery. The social worker is satisfied by this, but then raises concerns about the kind of education a child would receive while in the couple's care. The husband puts her mind at ease, saying, We've arranged for a full-time tutor who will teach the child all the usual subjects, along with French, Mandarin, and computer skills. Next, though, the social worker expressed concern about a child being raised in a circus environment. This time, the wife explains, our nanny is a certified expert in pediatric care, welfare, and diet. The social worker is finally satisfied and asks the couple, 
What age child are you hoping to adopt? The husband says, It doesn't really matter as long as the kid fits in the canon. The day finally arrived. Forrest Gump dies and goes to heaven. <laughs> He's met at the pearly gates by St. Peter himself. The gates are closed, however, and Forrest approaches the gatekeeper. St. Peter says, Well, Forrest, it's certainly good to see you. We have heard a lot about you. I must inform you that the place is filling up fast, and we've been administering an entrance exam for everyone. The tests are fairly short, but you need to pass before you can get into heaven. Forrest responds, It show sure is good to be here, St. Peter. I was looking forward to this. Nobody ever told me about any entrance exams. So hope the test ain't too hard. Life was a big enough test as it was. St. Peter goes on. Yes, I know, Forrest, but the test I have for you is only three questions. Here is the first. What days of the week begin with the letter T? Second, how many seconds are there in a year? Third, what is God's first name? Forrest goes away to think the questions over and he returns the next day and goes up to St. Peter to try to answer the exam questions. St. Peter waves him up and asks, Now that you've had a chance to think the questions over, tell me your answers. Forrest says, Well, the first one, how many days of the week begin with the letter T? Shucks, that one's easy. That'd be today and tomorrow. The saint eyes opened wide and he explains, Forrest, that's not what I was thinking. But you have a point though, and I guess I didn't specify, so I'll give you credit for that. How about the next one, says St. Peter? How many seconds are there in a year? Now that one's harder, said Forrest. But I thunk and thunk about that, and I guess the only answer can be 12. Astounded, St. Peter says, 12? 12? Forrest, how in heaven's name could you come up with 12 seconds in a year? Forrest says, shucks, there gotta be 12. January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd, Hold it, interrupts St. Peter. I see where you're going with it, and I guess I see your point, though that wasn't quite what I had in mind. I'll give you credit for that one, too. Let's go on with the next and final question, says St. Peter. Can you tell me God's first name? Forrest says, Well, sure. I know God's first name. Everybody probably knows it's Howard. Howard? asks St. Peter. What makes you think it's Howard? Forrest answers, It's in the prayer. The prayer? asks St. Peter. Which prayer? The Lord's Prayer, answers Forrest. Our Father, who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. <laughs> and now, for the funnies. <laughs> now for this week's funnies. Wait a minute. Which one is a cubit and which one is a centimeter? Soap on a rope on a pope on a slope. Despite his repeated efforts to explain things to her, Satan could never dissuade his mother from offering cookies and milk to the accused. Mom, no! Hellbillies. I reckon them must be the new souls. 
I reckon. When using the inflatable slide to exit the aircraft, put your hands over your head and yell, Frank started to get a funny feeling that his doctor was a quack. Mr. Milroney, this man is here to draw your blood. Oh, hello, doctor. Doctor? Hear that, Lulu? Our son thinks he's too good for the circus. He's got this ridiculous idea that he's going to run off and open a restaurant. I can't sleep. I have indigestion from eating all them fire ants before bed. You better take an antacid. Just as Dale entered the clearing and discovered standing together the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, and Jackie Onassis, his camera jammed. Becoming a rogue in his later years, Dumbo terrorized the world's flyways. <laughs> The Little Bang Theory. Where is everyone? <laughs> That's for me to know and you to find out is not a plea. Just say, guilty or not guilty. E, uh, e, uh. Uh, can I get an L, Pat? <laughs> Holy cow. Lord, protect Patty from the special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and sesame seed bun. Hallelujah! <laughs> but I identify as an angel. Yeah, we don't play that game. Embedded in styrofoam shoes, Carl is sent to sleep with the humans. <laughs> well, I got your final grades ready, although I'm afraid not everyone here will be moving up. Archaeologists digging, Fred and Wilma. <laughs> Welcome to A1 Zipper Company. Wait a minute, friends. Frank Stevens and Marketing, you all know Frank, has just handed me a note. Bob, your bottle AA-17 is wide open. And now, standing at my side, I give you the man who conquered Everest, the Matterhorn, Kilimanjaro. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Prove you're not a robot. OMG, that is so offensive. <laughs> what is the capital of Texas? Tay. That's true. Cattle drive quartets. Gus, what the hell you doing? This is Eine Kleine Nacht music. Third movement, Minuto Allegretto. You brainless horn toad. I see you looking at that French girl. Back to school, 1966. And 
2022. Water, nut and gluten-free snacks, SPF 60, <laughs> EpiPen, microchip, allergy alert, cell phone, GPS, camera equipped drone. So, they make water too, huh? <laughs> Stonehenge Office Complex. They couldn't run out the upper level, so they're going to dismantle all but the ground floor. So that concludes the funnies for this episode. <laughs> Bei Hut, der hat drei Ecken, drei Ecken hat mein Hut. Und hat er nicht drei Ecken, dann ist es nicht mein Hut. Wow, I hope that was, that was a great Opus Corner. And uh, I just want to remind y'all that all or every Opus Corner is now available on YouTube, and I'll leave the link in the description. So go show them some love uh, if you enjoy Opus Corner. All right, Opa. Well, that was a great Opus Corner, and let's get into some history. Okay, so this last weekend, me and my girlfriend went to a Texas Rangers baseball game, and uh, it was on 9-11. And we were shocked to see who threw out the first pitch. So Opa, let's play that first clip. So that's me and my girlfriend, Lindsay. My beautiful girlfriend, and now, Lindsay. ladies and gentlemen, delivering today's ceremony of first pitch baseball to Andita. Please welcome the 43rd president of the United States of America, George W. Bush. Thank you, President Bush. And now, Andita, fire a strike to Rocky Wolf. Texas Rangers invited former president and former Rangers owner George W. Bush to participate in Sunday's pregame ceremonies. Mr. Bush and former First Lady Laura Bush escorted Fort Worth police officer uh, Jimmy Polizani and his 13-year-old daughter to the mound to carry out the first pitch. The ceremony honored all first responders in attendance. There was also a moment of silence. <laughs> oh, man. So, I mean, wow, was that a great way for W? to celebrate his favorite holiday, 9-11. What do you think, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I think it's it's so crazy that over the years, the wars in the Middle East that were pushed through by the Bush administration, by Dick Cheney, and the cover-up of the, you know, the big questions of what actually happened on that day, still, they're kind of they're pushing through the, the official narrative that there wasn't anything fishy that happened and three plane, you know, three buildings fell with two planes. And uh, even though that there's been, you know, we're going to show some videos. Let's just put it that way. We're, we've just passed through that anniversary and, you know, there's something to it, man. So yeah, that, I think, you know, I, I, there's, <laughs> check this out. Um, Rudy, Rudy quoted, that 9-11 in some ways was the greatest day of his life. Wow. Um, so I don't know what that quote was taken from. Uh, New York Post posted, of course, but a lot of these people um, surrounding that event, uh, they kind Very of sketchy. established yeah. their agendas at that point. And so, you know, it's mm -hmm. definitely, we're not trying to be too vague. We're going to show videos. We're going to show, you know, some of the alternative narrative, but, uh, I mean, Very we didn't we didn't go to the game to to we, we didn't know that was going to happen. We were shocked. I mean, when do you get to when do you get the chance to actually yell mission accomplished, you know, and like heckle them? 
<laughs> so <laughs> anyway. you said people were booing you? What, what was no, that? No, they yeah, didn't people, like that you were... There was a row of people in front of me, and I, 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 I yelled something, and I yelled, Mission accomplished! You know, because of the, the thing, the banner from behind them from back in the day and uh i got the dirtiest looks and people were like boo and i was like he did 9 11 and they just didn't like that so oh man you know they, they can't take a joke but anyways that's all i got for the first clip so this next clip i'm about to show you is trump predicting 9 11 in 2000 and what he said through the years uh and about the bush family so check this out BuzzFeed dug up an old quote from Donald Trump talking about a large-scale terror attack 19 months before 9-11. In his 2000 book, The America We Deserve, Trump wrote, I really am convinced we are in danger of the sort of terrorist attacks that will make the bombing of the 1993 Trade Center look like little kids playing with firecrackers. We're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one and U.S. jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock and a few news cycles later, it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. Is this really Trump before 9-11? Have you read this? He predicted, basically predicted the attacks from Osama bin Laden. Donald, in, in, the year, in, in the year 2000, Donald, you considered running for president. If, if, if you had done that and if you had been successful, what do you think uh, you'd be doing right now? Well, I'd be taking a very, very tough line, Alan. I mean, uh, you know, most people feel they know uh, uh, at least approximately the group of people that did this and where they are. But um, boy, would you have to take a hard line on this. Well, I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw this huge explosion. I was with a group of people, and I, I, I really couldn't even believe it. What does the city need to do? Well, I guess the big thing that, that you really will have to do is never forget. You just can't forget that something like this happened. I was so disappointed when they closed the stock exchange, but of course, at some point, you had no choice. You know, when they initially announced it was closing, because you want to just say, the hell with it, you're going forward, nothing's going to change. But the fact is, something has changed very dramatically. You see these buildings, these two buildings, whether you love them or don't love them, they were a great part of the skyline. And then when you look at the skyline after 2001, and you're going to see a skyline without these two buildings, you're going to say, what happened? When you show your children or your grandchildren in years to come what New York looked like in the year 2000, and then what New York looked like just a year later, they're going to say, what happened? Well, I've never seen anything like it. I've seen two huge 110-story buildings that are reduced to rubble, uh, thousands and thousands of lives. I just got to see something that I've never seen before. I have hundreds of men inside working right now, and we're bringing down another 125 in a little while, and they've never done work like this before. Well, not only is it devastation, but it's very dangerous, because every few minutes a whistle would go off and everybody would just run, because you have all the buildings around it. People just don't know, and so they just have to take off, and then they come back, and they're working under 50-story buildings that you don't know if they're gonna, if they're gonna fall down. So mm -hmm. it's a terrible thing for the workers, and it's a terrible thing for the world, really. What was it like for you personally to go in and see all of what you saw? Well, it was amazing to see it. It was a very depressing scene, but I'll tell you what, you really can take heart. These firemen and policemen and the construction workers equally, the courage they have is unbelievable. George W. Bush will campaign in South Carolina for his brother. As you said tonight, and you've often said, the Iraq war and your opposition to it was a sign of your good judgment. In 2008, in an interview talking about President George W. Bush's conduct for the war, you said you were surprised that Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi didn't try to impeach him. You said, quote, which personally I think would have been a wonderful thing. A close quote. When you were asked what you meant by that, you said, for the war. For the war. He lied. He got us into the war with lies. Do you still believe President Bush should be impeached? So, let me just tell you. Obviously, the war in Iraq was a big, fat mistake. All right? Now, you can take it any way you want. It took Jeb Bush, if you remember, at the beginning of his announcement, when he announced for president, it took him five days before his people told him what to say. And he ultimately said, it was a mistake. 
The war in Iraq, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. George Bush made a mistake. That one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. So you still think he should be in peace? You do whatever you want. You call it whatever you want. I want to tell you, they lied. Okay. They said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none, and they knew there were none. There were no weapons of mass right. okay. destruction. I could care less about the insults that Donald Trump gives to me. It's blood sport for him. He enjoys it, and I'm glad he's happy about it. I am sick and Trump. tired of him going after my family. My dad is the greatest man alive in my mind. My brother was building a security apparatus to keep us <laughs> safe, and I'm proud of what he did. And he's had the gall to go the after World my Trade mother. Center came he's down had during the gall your brother's to go after reign. My Remember mother. that. Hold on. That's not keeping Look, us safe. I won safe. the lottery. My mom is the strongest woman I know. She should this be running. not about my Show them the fetus in the jar. George put it in the jar. He asked permission. And I gave him permission. He and I have a very special relationship. We tease all the time, and that's not very nice for me. But, you know, you got to tease a little bit. And he teases me unmercifully. But we're very close. I mean, I just love the fact that, that Trump just goes, goes off on the Bush family. And, you know, he said in the, in the 2001 clip, that workers were scared to go into the buildings because they were scared of collapse. Now, is he referring to Building 7, maybe? Or, you know, all the other sketchy stuff that was going on at the time? And uh, I love the 2016 clip where he says, um, I have it right here. He said, the World Trade Center fell down during your brother's reign. So he, he pretty much kind of like was kind of exposing that in a way. I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, there's uh, definitely something fishy about the whole narrative. Uh, and it's interesting <laughs> that Trump did so much. In those d early days, he was one of the few people that seemed to make comments that were counter-narrative, you could say. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting, you know, how much did Trump know about 9-11 when it actually happened he was definitely a building owner in new york um i you know those same quotes that you shared i, I was going to share as well Cummings of the 1993 trade center look like kids playing with firecrackers and he continues one day we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named osama bin laden is public enemy number one and the u.s jet fighters lay waste to his camp in afghanistan he escapes back under some rock and a few news cycles later it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. So he's even calling out Osama bin Laden and, and kind of speculative yep. about the shadowy figure, right? That mm -hmm. was, you know, packed with responsibility. Um, but, you know, I, I can't, you know, forget this one funny quote uh, when he goes, uh, never forget, <laughs> my building is now the tallest in Noah Manhattan. <laughs> yep. Whenever the 9 11 was happened, the tallest. He was like, the tallest. Now I'm the tallest. Yes. Oh, man. But, you know, there, there's so many things. I, I know you're probably going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, you might share some clips. But uh, even guys like George Carlin are known for calling out 9-11. I, I don't have a George Carlin clip today. I, I, I wish I would have. I, I totally forgot oh, about man. that. But uh, well, we can just tell people about it and they can go look it up. But for example, in his special, I kind of like it when a lot, when of, a lot of people die was yeah. recorded on September 10th, 9th and 10th in New York City. And, and between the 15 and 16 minute mark, you can go look this up. There's only audio mm -hmm. available now. He talks about planes exploding and bin Laden being falsely blamed for it. Now, it's not specific to exactly what happened, but. You know, when you look at the date, it was recorded on September 9th and 10th of 2001. Well, I know and that. What were you saying about this, Jeremiah? You were saying he wanted it scrubbed. Yeah, he didn't want any of the video to come out. There's a good Joe Rogan clip of him actually talking about this whole topic and how crazy it was. Like, he 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 felt like he willed it, and he kind of felt bad because he didn't mean it to be like that. I mean, it was just a play on words in a way. Like, it was just he was just being George Carlin, you know? And then that happened. And I'm pretty sure he was filming in New York city because that's where he did yeah, a lot of his, 
comedy special. So, I mean, if if you, uh, I should have pulled up that Joe Rogan clip too because it is very good. Uh, you know, because they talk about it and then they show kind of the history about it. They don't show it, but they talk about it. And uh, yeah, I'm just surprised that y you can't find any video of it now. You can only find the the audio version. So he really did not want that out. And I kind of wish, it, you know, it would leak or something because I, I would love to see it just for historical, you know, Value, preservation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so interesting that he uh, a comedian that covered so many kind of controversial conspiratorial topics mm -hmm. pretty much did this bit the day before this event happened crazy right and uh are now are, do, are you wanting uh, to get into some of the technology that could have equated to the building collapses and the you know, world trade 77 or do you want to do you have more no, to show you, you go ahead and, and let's play that clip and then i'll get into my last topic after after that since we're on the 9 11 topic Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, we're going to show first Rob Skiba's breakdown of the 9-11 topic. For those of you who are still like, ah, I buy the official narrative. Y'all are some <laughs> tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists. Let's check out this video Rob put together. Uh, and then we're going to get into the Nikola Tesla style frequency technology that could have equated in co complete free fall collapse of a building that supposedly fell due to floor fires but mm -hmm. uh it wasn't even touched by a, a plane or anything or a flame uh, and it collapsed like a controlled demolition so anyways let's watch this video opa the core of each tower was a rectangular pillar 87 by 133 feet comprised of 47 steel box columns ranging from 36 by 16 to 52 by 22 inches the story we were told this rock-like steel grid gave way because fire warped the trusses, causing the bolts to fail. As the trusses sagged and fell, the floors dropped with them. In its 2002 documentary, Why the Towers Fell, PBS creates a video model. Once the trusses failed, the floors they were holding cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. What remains standing? The tall, indestructible core. Why does PBS fail to explain the complete disappearance of the Twin Towers cores? By that evening, eyewitnesses and experts alike were rushing to defend the official narrative of events, claiming that raging jet fuel fires melted the steel inside the Twin Towers. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. Arlene Davis is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. She calls the 110-story tall twin tower tube structures. That means there are no internal columns holding it up. You know, when we saw this yesterday, people said, oh my goodness, there was a bomb on there. There must have been a bomb that must collapsed. must have been a bomb below right. that, that, that finished the job. Well, it turns out we heard from uh, experts who said that, you know what, the, the fire on those floors, probably 1,500 degrees. Steel can only withstand so much because the steel structure that holds the building up was on the outside and essentially the building started to melt and it gave way and it toppled cbs's jim stewart in washington has been tracking events all day and has the latest jim we're told rescue workers have recovered a passport and the debris it belonged to one of the dead hijackers another development on saturday new york officials revealed at a news conference here in the city that a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the world trade center crash site if you can believe that well dan not far from here a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers evidence this disaster scene is also a crime scene these passports are so magical and so wonderful that like golems ring they call to you they call to who they want to find them but not any normal mortal no 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 no. the ring calls out only to fbi agents let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of september the 11th malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves away from the guilty 
On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000 foot descending 270 degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground hitting the Pentagon in the Budget Analyst Office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them and the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victims' family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because nobody in our government at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. You will never, ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. Wow. Yeah. So your your dad put that short uh, edit together. And, um, you know, another thing to share with everyone uh, that's very interesting, it, it ties to this topic. If you're interested in... You know, getting to the nitty gritty, there's a organization that was founded called Architects, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And they re they submitted a September 11, the 9-11 Commission Report. Um, and it's a, uh, a breakdown of the buildings that collapsed, specifically World Trade Center Building 7, uh, mm -hmm. which collapsed at nearly freefall speed. And uh, if you watch the videos of it, I, I wasn't there. There's several different clips of it out online, but the building collapses completely straight down. Uh, unlike any other building that has collapsed from integrity fires, oh, yeah. uh, fires affecting its integrity. Um, and some of the, the questions were, how could these buildings have collapsed as if in a controlled demolition? Uh, despite the official narrative and one of the answers that I wanted to submit to you guys is an interesting video uh, that's uh, regarding Nikola Tesla style technology so Opa mm -hmm. if you would want to play uh, the first few minutes of this Nikola Tesla earthquake machine video in the middle of Manhattan everything was going according to plan 
until Tesla noticed something weird. Things around his workshop were vibrating. What started as a vibration in a glass of water quickly escalated into furniture dancing around and culminated on the entire building shaking like spaghetti. Things started to get serious. In a desperate act, Tesla solved the problem by breaking the main valve with a sledgehammer. The tragedy was averted, but Tesla would very soon hear the sirens from police cars and ambulances, because apparently, it wasn't just Tesla's building that was shaking. In reality, the entire neighborhood felt the result of his experiment. This was the story that a 79 years old Nikola Tesla told at the press meeting during his birthday party. And even though it's almost impossible to confirm if the story is true or not, the device is real. The apparatus that Tesla was testing in that day, and is now known as the earthquake machine, was actually not created for that purpose. Even if he said several times that it was able to destroy the Empire State Building. That's good. Okay. So, a building like the Empire <laughs> State Building could be destroyed by a Nikola, style te te uh, Nikola Tesla style technology. And just to explain in, in a concise way how it works, he found that material, uh, if a, a matching frequency was applied uh, to that material, it could basically turn it into a liquid. Uh, wow. Which is very interesting when you think about how the buildings collapsed without any kind of evidence of, uh, of explosives or nuclear radiation or whatever. Um, although there is some interesting narratives regarding possible, you know, hiding of any radiation, short-term lived radiation around ground zero. But uh, the way that he explains his technology was you take two frequencies uh, that are dissonant and those dissonant frequencies when applied to the structural integrity of the building, uh, you know, you just find out what that the bad frequency for that particular building's material is, and you could just, you know, wow. pretty much turn it into a powder. Um, and if he, if Tesla back then was saying they could destroy buildings such as the Empire State Building, perhaps this is one of the ways that this controlled demolition could have happened. And um, you know, this is you know one of those conspiracies that really kicked off the past. 20 years of deception a lot of the things that have happened over the recent 20 years especially the war in I iraq and afghanistan were mm -hmm. used 9-11 to justify pretty much a pharmaceutical opium war uh yep. where poppy fields were protected only a mile and a half off the main roads even though they cleared them for any news teams that might show up and go for a drive uh and just the the oil cartel corporate America wars that have been fought the past 20 years, they can all point to 9-11 as their justification. And uh, unfortunately, there was not much evidence to support the fact that these weapons of mass destruction <laughs> were actually ever there to be used against anybody in, a, in a, an actual uh, dangerous way. I mean, there was like weapons from the 1980s that were degrading in bunkers, but uh, before we worried about those, the army raided their national museums and took hostage a ton of the, you know, the artifacts from the Middle East as Rob broke down in some of his Babylon Rising break, you know, discussions. He talked about how one of the first items that they went in and confiscated when the army went over there because of 9-11 in 2004 and such was they went to the Baghdad Museum and took took all the artifacts involving resurrection and um, and took away you know mm -hmm. uh, all these uh, artifacts you know surrounding Osiris's resurrection and and you know the, all these different things kind of tie into this interesting alternative perspective uh, of a mainstream 9/11 ideology that's still being pushed on the general populace and yet there are groups like that i shared that you guys can research such as the architects for architects and engineers for 9 11 truth and there's also a great documentary that he had listed underneath that short video called loose change mm -hmm. um, but there's many others out there that are breaking down this topic i almost feel like 9 11 was this generation's jfk assassination or the next generations, kind of the way that they 
you know, try to conceal the truth and try to hide it from uh, the masses. And then they call you a conspiracy theorist if you if you think anything else. So I don't know. That's very interesting. Yeah. I remember th this and, was like one of the first this is one of the first topics that uh, me and my dad actually like were, would talk about at breakfast or whenever. And uh, yeah. I just wanted to share this last picture. Uh, you know, the, the world deserves a better class of prankster. Blow up psyops, not buildings. Right? <laughs> um, so that's what we're here to destroy. Nothing physical, just the psyops around the narratives. Yep. All right. Well, I have something kind of uh, very unrelated to 9-11. So for my last topic in history, Let's go back to 1964 and talk about the messed up murder of Sam Cooke, this man right here. And uh, Sam Cooke was the king of soul. He was an American singer, songwriter, and uh, he was the most influential soul. Here, he's right here, too. <laughs> he was the most influential soul singers of all time. And his death was so, it is so weird that I had to make this video about it. And um, I want to get your thoughts after after I play this video because it's it left me speechless. All the all the info that I learned during the process of making this. So let's play that clip. Sam Cooke is often called the father of soul, and he almost single-handedly brought soul music to a wider audience around the world. He was not just a singer, but he wrote songs too. He was an astute businessman who established a company to publish his songs. He also played a pivotal role in the civil rights movement. The manner of Sam Cooke's death, however, has been surrounded by scandal and inaccuracies that have exercised the minds of writers and commentators for more than 50 years. Although reports say he was killed in self-defense, there may be reason to believe he was murdered and may be even part of a large-scale government conspiracy. At 14, Sam joined the Highway QCs and rose to be the lead singer of the group. When he was 19, he took over as lead singer of the Soul Stirrers. Under the leadership of R.H. Harris, they signed a record deal with Specialty Records. Sam began to write songs as well as sing. Sam was young, handsome, and attracted attention from young fans. It was not unusual for young female fans to rush towards the stage when the Soul Stirrers were performing just to get a close-up glimpse of Sam. In 1957, Sam left the Soul Stirrers to follow a solo career. As a means of marking this new beginning, Sam added an E to the end of his name. As a solo performer, Sam pioneered the growth of soul music in the mainstream of pop music. He led where many other soul singers were to follow. Performers like Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Al Green, Bobby Womack, Otis Redding, and James Brown owed much to Sam Cooke's breaking the barriers between soul and rock and roll. Sam's greatest hits include classics like Twistin' the Night Away, You Send Me, Bring It On Home To Me, Chain Gang, Wonderful World, and Cupid. His best known hit is probably A Change Is Gonna Come. The inspiration for A Change Is Gonna Come came from Martin Luther King's I Have A Dream speech. Sam claimed that A Change Is Gonna Come came to him in a dream as a whole, complete song. Sam had long been a supporter of the civil rights movement, and A Change Is Gonna Come was adopted by the movement as one of their anthems. A single of the song did not appear until two weeks after Sam's death. Before we examine his death, we need to catch up on his life outside the music industry. In 1953, Sam married Dolores Milligan, who was a singer and dancer known professionally as Dee Dee Mohawk. They divorced in 1958. The following year, Dolores was killed in an automobile accident in Fresno. Sam married again in 1958, this time to Barbara Campbell. Together they had three children. Tragically, the youngest, Vincent, drowned in a swimming pool at their home when he was just two years old. Sam Cooke had a reputation as a womanizer, and many speculate this is what led to his death. At the time of his death, Sam was at the pinnacle of his career. He had a broad fan base and was getting hit after hit. He was known to be sympathetic to the aims of the civil rights movement and expressed his views in song and through interviews. Taken at face value, his death seemed straightforward. He was shot by the night manager of a motel who feared he was going to attack her. She claimed she acted in self-defense. The authorities accepted her explanation and declared the death to be justifiable homicide. Many others, including his friends, family, and various witnesses, disagreed, and the events surrounding Sam's death have been debated ever since. He went down to Martoni's, which was a big place in Hollywood where the whole record crew used to hang. He sees some other friends in a booth 
near his and there is a young woman sitting with these men and he finds her attractive and he goes over to say hello to his friends and this young lady was introduced to him as Lisa Boyer. Sam takes a liking to Lisa and he invites her to join him for the rest of the evening. Instead of driving Lisa Boyer back to her hotel in Hollywood, he took her to the Hacienda Motel. On December 11th, 1964, Sam Cooke booked a room in the Hacienda Motel in LA with a girl named Elisa Boyer. She had been booked in as Mrs. Cooke, but in fact, she and Sam had eaten at a restaurant in town and then came to the Hacienda together. The manager of the motel, Bertha Lee Franklin, later testified that she did not see Miss Boyer resist in any way. Sam's infidelities were well known, and he had fathered at least three children illegitimately. In a room at the motel, Elisa Boyer claimed Sam tore off her clothing, and she feared he was going to rape her. They go into the motel. She's there voluntarily. Then, think about this. He starts to get undressed. He goes to the bathroom. She runs out with his clothes, his pants, what have you. Runs to disappear someplace saying he wanted to rape. But what guy says, hey, hey, you lay down on the bed. I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going to come back and rape you. You know? stupid. When he went to the bathroom, she grabbed her clothes and fled. In grabbing her clothes, she also scooped up most of Sam's clothes. When he came out of the bathroom, he realized what happened and gave chase. Elisa, meantime, had tried to raise the night manager and hide in her office. The night manager was too slow in coming to the office door, and Elisa fled to the street. Sam reached the office, and thinking Elisa was in there, demanded entry. Uh, Sam Cook wearing a suit jacket, but supposedly nothing else, uh, chases her down and, and meets the, the night manager of the, of the motel. Strangely, the manager, a 55-year-old woman named Bertha Lee Franklin, was on the phone with the motel owner when Sam came banging on her door around 3 a.m. Now, the owner of the motel is hearing all of this on the phone, and she later testified to all of this in court. He was dressed only in a jacket and with one shoe. The night manager was a woman named Bertha Franklin. Sam eventually breaks the door down and attacks her. She managed to crawl over to where she kept a gun, and she shot him. Shot him in the chest. Sam lunged towards her, and she hit him several times with a broom handle. The gunshot had been fatal, though, and Sam collapsed and died on the floor of the office. Last words were supposedly, lady who shot me. He's clinging to her until finally he let go and bled to death there on the floor of her room. The police soon arrived on the scene. They didn't know who he was. They assumed incorrectly that uh, he was just uh, robbing this woman in the middle of the night. It wasn't until around 6 o'clock that evening that authorities realized the man in the morgue was singer Sam Cooke. Despite the high-profile nature of the case, the police seemed eager to close the investigation. That's the official story, and the one recorded by police. Elisa Boyer had dressed after fleeing the hotel and had hidden Sam's clothes. She rang the police from a phone booth outside, claiming attempted rape. Bertha Franklin also rang the police from her office. The owner of the motel had been on the telephone talking with Bertha Franklin and heard the scuffle and the gunshot through the dropped receiver. She also rang the police. But that was the story Lisa Boyer told the cops. For Sam Cooke's family, friends, and fans, this case was far from over. There are, however, a number of inconsistencies we have to highlight. Firstly, restaurant staff and customers where the pair had eaten claimed Sam had a large quantity of money with him. Ostensibly, this was to buy Christmas gifts. Jess Rand saw Sam Cooke the day before his death. My office was in Beverly Hills, and he wanted to get a lot of his Christmas shopping done because he was going to be on the road. Rand cashed a check for Cook in the amount of 5000 bucks. That money was never recovered. Bertha Franklin had at one time been an operator of a brothel, and rumors persisted after the killing that she and Boyer, who had worked as a prostitute, were running a scam. Boyer would find victims and offer to sleep with them, but the two women would pickpocket them and then cry rape. Franklin had shot a motel guest in similar circumstances just six months earlier. Boyer claimed she had been forced to accompany Sam to the Hacienda. But again, both customers and staff at the restaurant say she left willingly with no sign of coercion. If she went willingly with Sam to the hotel room, it cast doubts on her claim of being forcibly stripped. I'll never believe the reason that they gave for him getting killed. And I was devastated. Sam Cooke didn't have to rape any woman. 
So because there were too many women who would rape Sam. It's also not clear whether she did grab some of Sam's clothes accidentally or if it was done on purpose. Perhaps having Sam chase her when he was virtually naked would add substance to their story. Those who viewed Sam's body when it had been laid out in his coffin were alarmed at the beating he must have taken before he died. Reliable witnesses like Etta James claim that a broom handle could not have caused the injuries they saw. The coroner's in inquest overlooks lots of, lots of detail that were there. The autopsy also revealed that Sam had a two-inch bump on the side of his head. The lump on the head was something more than you would get just by merely falling after, after being shot. The hotel manager not guilty of, uh, of, of manslaughter. According to the coroner's report, Sam Cook had a blood alcohol level of 0.14, nearly double the legal driving limit. Cook's death was ruled a justifiable homicide. Muhammad Ali made a statement, you know, he was a good friend of Sam's. If that was Paul McCartney, who was killed, they'd be investigating it. Sam's head had been almost severed, and he was bruised and cut to a major extent. We can only guess. There are some who suggest that Alan Klein, Sam's manager, might have been behind the murder. Sam's hmm. death would give Klein ownership of the rights to Sam's back catalog, and so bring more wealth to Klein. Sam Cook became one of the first black recording artists to start his own record company. You look at a guy who had the ability to divorce himself from the, from the record uh, machine and go around the country and put together his own shows, you can imagine that was a very terrifying thing uh, to some people in 1964 to do something to, uh, to pull the plug on this guy as a, as a message to others. It leaves you with a distinct impression that there are some other forces that had, uh, had played. Another popular theory is that a government agency, such as the FBI or CIA, were the prime movers in the murder. Perhaps they wished to remove a civil rights activist whose popularity they feared? It's argued that Franklin and Boyer were implicit in a deal that guaranteed them immunity from prosecution for other crimes. This theory tries to explain the injuries Sam sustained by suggesting he was beaten up by government agents before being shot. Whether the shot was fired by Franklin or someone else can't be proven. Bertha Lee Franklin claimed that after she shot Cook through the heart, he lunged at her once more. She had three bullets left in her 22 caliber pistol, but Franklin testified that she put the gun down and hit Cook with a wooden stick. And she shot him with a, with a 22. And she had a 32 registered to her name, not a 22. As far as mysteries go, this death was definitely a setup. It may or may not be relevant to note that Elisa Boyer was arrested the following month for agreeing to have sex with an undercover police officer for $40. 15 years later, she was charged with manslaughter and convicted for shooting her then boyfriend. The woman that Sam was with was a hustler. He picked the wrong girl to go with and, and they were gonna hustle him and, and rob him. Lisa Boyer, Bertha Lee Franklin, and the owner of the motel took lie detector tests and all were found to be telling the truth. During the investigation, both Franklin and Boyer successfully passed lie detector tests. Naturally, experts have since questioned the accuracy and reliability of such tests. Do you think the case is open and shut or is there more we don't know? I mean, what are your thoughts about that, Jake? Like, is that the, the part about the manager? Is that not exactly what the last couple episodes have kind of been about? And like, why is there so much? What do you wow. think? Yeah, I mean, the, what a crazy, another example of possible suspicious circumstances around a, you know, a, a star, upcoming star being put off. And then his manager, whoever has so much to gain from this guy. You know, I, I will say this one seemed to me more likely the official narrative until they said that the girl was caught mm -hmm. possibly being like uh, like being a prostitute for 40 bucks for an undercover cop cuz you know right away i'm like okay maybe she was a nice girl maybe she just wanted to hang out you know date you know date sam cook and then he kind of coerced her into his room and that's why she freaked out and claimed rape but then it makes me think like uh, like when they said she's a prostitute i'm like yeah. hold on you don't claim you know you, it's just so many things there well i mean um, why why would she mention... take why would she take his clothes that's a weird thing to do she was or okay so when sam cook went to the bathroom if she claims that she was being raped right what when has that ever happened the man says okay i'm gonna go to the bathroom and then i'm gonna rape you right is yeah, that kind of strange it, it, and then Definitely later on, they found not, out that oh, situation I, either way. I left this part out, but the the owner was actually uh, she owned a brothel. 
Is that not weird? And they also think that that the owner of that mo or the, not the owner, but the lady that shot Sam Cook was uh, the pimp of the girl. A lot of people think that, and you know, I could I could totally see it. I mean, there's just so many weird circumstances that I don't know. It's kind of kind of different. Comes with that lifestyle, the danger, I guess. If you want to be a successful, you know, musician, or you know, you want to make it big Just in the music faithful. entertainment world, yep. stay, stay faithful. Or you know, another answer is uh, be independent. You know, produce your own record labels and yeah. don't get a manager because they seem to off their their uh, proteges or their you know big business money maker uh catalog you know musicians but anyways man yeah that was pretty interesting i, I wasn't super familiar with sam cook mm -hmm. uh but you know the god the godfather of soul um that's I james brown i think, I think. Hearing his... oh james brown. Uh, what, he's the father he god... what... he's the father of it he's that's what they call him he's like he was like uh, the inspiration for like aretha franklin and everybody that okay. came after but but godfather sounds a lot cooler i think you know well, one of the you know the the recent things that I I thought sounded as cool is forefather. If you have four kids, you are forefather. Oh, <laughs> hmm. that's what we're aiming we're aiming for that. Maybe like fifty kids. You know, we, <laughs> we have an empire to build. So uh, I don't know my my wife's up for that, but uh, you know we'll we'll see how it goes. All right, man. Well, that's all I got for history. And uh, before we move on, I wanted to remind you guys. If you would like to submit a topic, story, memes, and more, please email submit at skibanewsnation.com. Also, if you want to write us a letter, send your letter to Jeremiah Skiba, P.O. Box 560271, The Colony, Texas 75056. All right. Well, Jake, are you ready for some memes? Yeah, I got a couple for us today. All right, let's get into it. Meme me up. Uh, as a, a YouTube-er and a YouTube watcher, uh, this rings true for me. When YouTube plays an unskippable ad, but you look away <laughs> so that they don't win. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I got YouTube uh, premium. Man. <laughs> man, there is so, there were so many jokes over the years that made fun of YouTube premium. And then eventually I, I, I think I paid for it as well. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, just not having to deal with the ads is mm -hmm. great. Uh, but then all the time I get on YouTube and I don't log in and I have to watch them anyways. So it's like, ah. Uh. Um, but it's like forced brainwashing, man. Like you just mm -hmm. turn on a video and who knows what's going to pop up. We have to deal with it all the time when we're trying to show you guys clips on Skiba News Nation yeah. waiting for the ads yep. to finish. And all this woke stuff. I mean, every commercial I've seen for a long time now, has been this woke agenda stuff. It's crazy. Yep. All right. Uh, next uh, picture here. Sometimes you just need to leave your problems behind. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, somebody True. who got a, a a boot on their tire, and they just, they just took the, the tire off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of clever. You kind of lost your tire. Um, all but... right. So uh, whenever we talk about the left right paradigm and we also talk about, you know, politics and the laws being passed, they're pretty much just as confusing as this sign right here. The right lane must right left. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty obscure. Uh, what does that even mean? Our... Is that a real sign? <laughs> Apparently somebody took this picture. Oh, my gosh. I'm already confused when driving sometimes, and that would just mess yeah. me up. <laughs> oh, man. In the Philippines, where I learned how to drive, they didn't care if you, like, drove up on the sidewalk or went counterflow. So I learned to drive in a very uh, confusing uh, place where you're, like, having to, like, bumper to bumper everywhere. But then when I got back here to the States, I learned that this part of the world 
is so much more dangerous driving because in the Asian countries that have those bumper to bumper traffic type situations, everybody's always on the lookout for mm-hmm. the crazy nutto that's going to, you know, cross over in front of you. So you're always on the look, you know, everybody's breaking rules. So you got to be aware here, people trust signs and stoplights and this and that so much that they don't pay attention. And so mm-hmm. it's doubly dangerous, you know, coming up to a, uh, you know, uh, an intersection because there's so much more of a kind of a blind trust that everything's going to go your way. And that's when you have these cataclysmic just you know, yeah. crashes and stuff. So I, I'm always much more on, on my heels, probably because of growing up in the Philippines and driving there. Uh, so whenever I'm here in the States, like, man, people are, they, they just are no common crazy sense. here yeah they they're crazy but they don't have the like the the head swivel they're just crazy yep. in one direction and you better not be in their way <laughs> mm-hmm. yep no common sense i feel on the on the roads i, t- I had to tra- take driver's ed and i know a lot of people that never did it's crazy yeah some people just jump in and start driving <laughs> here's a here's a meme for our conspiratorial minded people uh, small minds discuss people. Average minds discuss events. Great minds discuss Bigfoot. <laughs> now, I would say uh, I'm not actually too much of a Bigfoot fanatic myself. Uh, I think it's uh, possible, like, a possible answer to the Bigfoot question is, you know, the North Americas were known for Nephilim tribes. What if it's the remnants of these tribes, you know, throughout the ages hiding out in caves or something? But uh, I would replace Bigfoot with uh, the shape of the earth or 9-11 or Mm -hmm. the Bohemian Grove or the pharmaceutical evil tyrannical agenda uh, or, you know, what, what, what name you. Yeah. Uh, History channel. We're pitching you this idea right now. (laughs) These are our show ideas. You need to make it. (laughs) So, uh, you know, good, funny meme, but I would, you know, insert in there, you know, some more probably prevalent uh, topics that actually have an effect on you and me, right? So, uh, but I just Mm -hmm. thought it was funny. Um, And for our final uh, little picture here, uh, Joe says, I live in a trailer shark. Me, you mean trailer park? No, this is where he lives. A trailer shark. <laughs> so anyways, uh, remember everybody, you can submit your memes for review at submit at skibanewsnation.com. So don't forget to do that. And that's all I got for today. Thank you for joining us. Awesome, man. All right, man, you got any shout outs or anything? Yeah, shout out to uh, BB for the gravy. You know, some really interesting breakdowns. Uh, you know, your your recent 9-11 theories have been interesting as well as some of your memes you share on Instagram. So those, somewhere I'm sourcing some of those I've shared at the beginning of the show. Shout out to the Bertaria Times app. You can find me on there at Gibberim Bear. And uh, it's a great social media that's kind of just about community building and about the good, the true, the beautiful. So I like to give that a shout out. I get some of our funny memes from their satire section Uh, and shout out to Gail for sharing uh, the recent news article I I brought up today uh, regarding the, uh, the closure of the the freight trains. So uh, that's all. Thank you everybody for all your submissions and, and keep sending them over to our email and we'll be sure to try to include them during the show. Yep, and uh, thank you everybody for watching episode 15. We'll see you in episode 16, so stay tuned.
Hey, Skiba News Nation family, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also help support this channel by getting yourself some Skiba News Nation merch. Also, we are proud to announce that we are now on Patreon, where you will get bonus content, shoutouts, and much more. Thank you again for watching and helping us stay on the quest for truth. Huge shout out to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this show without you. If you want to help support us, go to patreon.com forward slash Skiba News Nation. We are also proud to announce that Skiba News Nation podcast is now available on podcast platforms. My new book, Never Got to Say Goodbye, is now available. My book contains an up-close and personal account of who my father, Rob Skiba, truly was as a father and as a man. It includes over a hundred never-before-seen photos of my dad and our family. A portion of the proceeds are going towards funding our search for justice for my dad, Rob Skiba. Visit SkibaNewsNation.com forward slash book. Again, SkibaNewsNation.com forward slash book. To learn more about the book, our website will show you where and how you can purchase my book. Also, you can sign up to be notified when my mom's book is ready. Her book will be a first-hand account of the 40 days of terror that my dad and our family experienced at the hands of the medical system that completely denied him of his human rights and how they denied my mom's right to be my dad's medical power of attorney. Thank you so much for your support and for helping us stay on the quest for truth and carrying on my dad's legacy.